Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. I was born one morning when the sun didn't sh- Fox with Octavist, I'm your host, Sandra Mayung, and today I'm with the one and only Mr. Holloway. Please introduce <coughs> yourself, Mr. Holloway. Hello out there, this is Eric Holloway. Glad mm, to see voice. you. Happy to be wow. here, man. <laughs> Happy to see you too. Um, so guys, as you all know, Mr. Holloway has a really, really deep voice. In fact, one of the deepest voices I've ever heard. So, Mr. Holloway, what's the secret to your voice? Is it the food that you eat? Is it your culture? Is, is, it, that, is it that good Florida weather? What is it? Well, some of those might attribute to it, but um, I inherited it from my dad. He's a bass, not as deep as I am, but uh, all my life, he, he's always had a, a deep voice. So, um, I just figured, you know, like father, like son. <laughs> but me being, me being a little more musically inclined, I'm also a, a singer, and um, and I know a lot of different aspects of music and, and singing and all that kind of thing, vocalizing. I think I took it a little further than my father did, even though he sang in a quartet. But, um, yeah, I, I, I think it was just inherited, you know, God-given. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So, uh, unfortunately, my uh, choir director just contacted me right now, but that's okay because this is more important. (laughs) All right. So, Mr. Holloway, what makes a bass? So, in your mind, when someone says, I'm a bass, and it's they're not a bass, they're really a tenor, and that probably happens a lot to you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, What do you, what makes a bass? Well, for me, um, if you, if you look at any, musical scale or piano scale it, it'll take the notes down the scale from high to low and there are certain sections within that scale that determine soprano one two alto one two tenor one two baritone one two bass one two and then at the bottom you have octavist um so if you can fluently sing within any of those scales those are the um that is your vocal range that's mm-hmm. that's what i would consider your vocal range yeah if you if you can use those notes usable notes usable notes yeah <laughs> <laughs> within, a, within a song then i would consider that your vocal range no matter how high or low that is yeah so if you consider yourself to be a bass then you would fall into that bass range on that scale simple as that yeah so knowing you, Mr. Holloway, you probably get a whole bunch of videos of people saying, hey, Mr. Holloway, <laughs> check out this low note that I sang. And uh, yeah. it turns out to be what you say, vocal fry. Um, yeah. um, what, what is, why do people do vocal fry and why do they say it's their range? Um, well, I think they do it, one, because it gives them the satisfaction and, and gratification of sounding deep which is you know that's understandable yeah. i always want to sound deep my father was deep <laughs> i want to sound deep um a lot of guys even women they love that bass sound you know um so so i get that it's you know you want to feel that gratitude that gratification uh, and that satisfaction of actually sounding like someone that you admire so much but the the the, the technique I guess the technique is the vehicle that gets you to that point of gratification. Yeah. Um, now, me, myself, I don't use any techniques. I say that repeatedly in interviews. <laughs> um, I, if I need to do some kind of technique, then I feel like, you know, I'm just putting on a show or act or whatever. But um, naturally, I can sing within these different scales. And, and I use that in the music that I perform. Uh, mm-hmm. The songs that I sing, the videos that you've probably seen me do, the multi-tracks yeah. that covering all the different voices. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, but um, I, I don't knock anybody who just has that passion to, to sound deep, you know? I love the sound, Yeah, I, I, and a lot of other people do too. Um, 
So yeah, if if that technique, vocal fry, I don't necessarily like the sound of vocal fry. It doesn't sound natural to me. Mm-hmm. Um, me having a trained ear and, and being around singers most of my life as I have been, I can really pick out what's real and what's not real as far as somebody's voice, yes. whether they're speaking or singing. Um, the way it's colored, the way they, uh, uh, whether it's forced, um, all all sorts of things you can pick up just by sing, listening to somebody speak or sing if you know what you're listening to. Yes. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's like any profession. If you go into a hospital and speak to a doctor and you might know some medical terms and you might be able to talk eloquently with those different medical terms. But at some point, that doctor is going to know you don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) It's the same way with any profession, Uh, Mm -hmm. a plumber. You know, you hang out for a day with a a professional plumber. You can play the game for a a little while based on some YouTube DIY videos you watched, you know, uh, or Home Depot book that you read through. But eventually that professional is going to know there's some holes in your story. (laughs) <laughs> um, just from their experience and it's the same way with singing you know i can listen to somebody speak or sing and and they can tell me all these grandiose things that they've done but uh eventually the the cracks will show and the truth will come out so my thing is just be who you are enjoy the voice that you have no matter what the range is and make that the best that you can make it awesome all right, so going on from vocal fry, you always say usable notes, and we've discussed this before beforehand, yeah. usable notes. I know right now um, there's a lot of kids right now saying I could hit like a G negative one or a G <laughs> negative two or A zero. And at yeah. that point, um, both of you and I agree, there's a point where notes aren't musical anymore. Yeah, it's just it's just tones. It's just sounds. And and the key word you said there was hit, hit a note. I want to I want to hear somebody sing a note. Mm. You know, I want to hear somebody control that note, make it soft, and then uh, a, a extenuate it. You know, uh, yeah. give it some vibrato, and then take the vibrato out of it. That's controlling a note. That's a usable yeah. note. But um, just hitting a, a a tone that's on the scale. Well, what is that? You know, that's a circus trick. <laughs> and, and just like any tricks some people are good at tricks and some people aren't so good at tricks you know so um my question behind that is okay why why are you doing that what's the point <laughs> of that what are you proving you know mm, yes yes so um so um vocal fry you know a lot of bases in the southern gospel world use vocal fry and they have microphones um, and it sounds pretty good when you have an EQ and you use vocal fry or chest fry, whatever you call it, into a right. microphone, it can sound pretty decent. Um, right. But do you still consider those people real basses? Well, I don't get into the controversy of what's real and what's not. Um, at the end of the day, when everybody's lying in the dark on their pillow and they're thinking about themselves and what they do, they know what's real and what's not. Yeah. You know? So uh, I just leave it at that. I'm not going <laughs> to compare myself to anybody, and I'm not going to put down anybody else's creativity or craft when they're trying to do it to the best of their ability. But I will say <clears throat> there's, a, there's a place for that in gospel, southern gospel music. Yeah. Um, it's not my place, but there's a place for that. And... Uh, I enjoy it just like so many millions of other people around the world enjoy it. Oh, yeah. So I'm, so I'm not going to knock it. Yeah. No, I love some of the basses that use vocal fry. Paul David Kenimer, um, Ken Turner, those guys know how to use it and utilize it very well, in fact. Very, well, it's, it sounds... a, it's a technique, like exactly. I said. And yeah. Some people do those techniques well, and some people don't, you know? <laughs> and that's like any other technique. Exactly. But, uh, I, I uh, somebody mentioned on a recent video I posted on Instagram, you know, when I sing into my higher register falsetto um, and somebody made the comment that, you know, he has such a low voice. He doesn't use any techniques to sing low, 
but when it comes to singing high, he uses technique. So I don't know. I don't know if I interpreted the correct way what he was claiming, but either way, my thing is usable notes. And if you exactly. listen to that, if you listen to that piece, I was using every bit of those notes in the song that I was singing. So I don't know what if he was trying to make a point or, or what, but my thing is <laughs> usable notes. So yeah. I'll do falsetto usable notes. You know, if I thought I needed to do vocal fry to get to those bass notes, I would do that only if I was doing usable notes in a song. But I don't need to do that. <laughs> Thanks, and, Mr. And that's, Holloway. That's not bragging or, or you oh, know. No. I'm, oh, I'm very we all, we all know, Mr. Holloway. There's no need to defend yourself. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, out of all of the bass singers you've ever heard, who is your favorite? My personal favorite is Vladimir Pasukov. He had that warm subwoofer sound to his voice that just projected over a choir of just so effortlessly um i don't know who it is for you um who is your favorite bass singer of all time i never really got to the point of looking for or choosing who was my favorite there are so many different wonderful deep voices out there or that i've heard in my lifetime um in all genres of music that i admire admired um but uh, I never got to the point of um, who is my favorite. I don't really have a favorite. Um, like I said, there's a lot of a lot of great basses out there that I admire. One of the current basses that uh, Baso Profundos even that um, I not too long ago befriended and we became friends is uh, Morris Robinson in the opera world. Yes. And and uh, he he's really taken a liking to my voice as much as I've taken a liking to his voice. So it's a mutual respect and appreciation for what each of us bring. And I think if you talk to most um, creatives in their own right, that's how they'll feel about other people that do what they do. It's a mutual respect because we know what it took to get to that level um or get to that point in a career uh a lot of what i have is god given which is what a lot of creatives have it starts with a, a given talent or ability to do something but then we take it a little further than that and we we hone it and we practice and and it's hours and hours of practice or study you know um which brings me to a point about music in general when i was going to uh, college on a voice scholarship, one of the things I had to do was study music theory. And I hated music theory. Um, and the reason I hated it was because in the process of learning how to compose, which is a lot of what music theory is, the, the, the nuts and bones of composition, music competition, composition, um, my thing was always, and, and me and my teacher always went back and forth about this. My thing was, after I did this little composition and put it together, you know, the cadences and all that kind of thing. One, did I like the way it sounded? Two, do other people like the way it sounds? Does it bring joy to other people? Does it bless somebody else when they hear it? Does it, does it stir emotions in people when they hear it? So to me, that was the, the point not whether it was technically correct or not as music theory goes now mm -hmm. i'm not knocking, i'm not knocking music theory that was just how i felt about it yeah but um but i understand the necessity especially as a songwriter or a composer why music theory is necessary but mm -hmm. um but for me it, it just seemed to hold back my creativity because i i could do things that sounded pretty that sounded nice that moved people but Theoretically, it wasn't correct. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to look at the word theory. What's yeah. a theory? You know, it's music theory. It's not music fact. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm sure a lot of people would start screaming at the camera when they hear me say that. But 
I, I, I'm, I'm not knocking music theory, but that's just my personal feeling about it. I learned it. I had to learn it to pass my courses. Um, and, it, and it gave me some fundamental knowledge about music and composition. Um, things that I could use when I do sing, you know. But for the most part, it's kind of like you hear people say, well, why do I need to learn uh, math? You know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a janitor, you know, or, or I, I never plan to use anything with math. But if you, if you dig deep enough, math is in everything that we do. <laughs> you know, you may not need to know trig or calculus to the extent that, you know, you're, you're, you're an Einstein or anything like that. But the basics of math is in everything that we do. Uh, you can figure out almost any problem with math you know, and, and science, you know, so, so I'm not knocking any of those things. I think they're necessary. I think, I think it's good for all of us to have at least a basic knowledge of those things. And then whatever your particular field is that you may need to take it further. But, um, but just on the basics, uh, yeah, it's a good thing. Great. Awesome. Thanks. The next question that we have is, does voice acting help your singing or vice versa? Um, well, I was a singer many years before I was a voice actor. So I would say it's vice versa. I think my singing actually benefited from my voice acting career in the way that music is cadence. Speaking is cadence. Yes. There's, a, there's, a, there's a musical cadence to speaking, to talking. And um, my knowledge and understanding of music and, under, and singing for all the years that I've been doing it since the age of five kind of helped me naturally take that move into voice acting, um, where some people who aren't musical do voice acting very well themselves. But I think um, it's like a fingerprint. You know, every fingerprint is different among all the billions of people on the planet. Every fingerprint is different. Like they say about snowflakes, there's no two alike. Yeah. So each one is unique. Uh, so I think part of my uniqueness as a voice actor is the fact that I have musicality in my DNA from all the years that I've been singing and learning music and, and playing instruments. I played instruments for several years. Um, yeah. I played the saxophone for three years. Uh, I played the tube in marching band. You know, so um, and I'm I'm familiar with the piano, even though I never got to be a virtuoso on it like Liberace. But uh, but uh, I understand the instrument. Um, so I would say, yeah, musicality, the music, the singer in me definitely uh, gave me a certain color, a certain flavor in my voiceover work. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thanks. Thanks for that for that question uh, answer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Sorry. Uh, people don't know, if you don't know this, uh, I'm a big fan of Mr. Holloway. We've already talked a while, but I'm still trying to um, get this process done. And I'm actually talking with the guy. It's amazing. <laughs> I appreciate all the support, man. Uh, people show me love all the time. And me showing love back is to continue singing and putting it out there. So Amen. it's a two-way it's a two-way street, so I, yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> so, Mr. Holloway, um, the next question is, how do you project the lowest notes in your chest voice? Is there, a, is, there a, is there a process in your mind that goes through your head, or do you just, do you just sing? Is that what you do? Yeah, I just open my mouth and sing. Um, there are people out there who understand the mechanics and the biology behind how sound is made and, and uh, diaphragm and all that kind of thing, projection. I just never got deep into that. Um, like I said, I started singing when I was five years old. So give me, a, uh, give me some music, give me some words to sing. I open my mouth and I sing. And even going through music theory and all the things I've learned along the way, those things really didn't interest me about how the sound was made. Um, but, uh, but I, I'm familiar with that stuff. You just become familiar because that's what you do. Yeah. And once you've been doing it for so long, you, you learn that stuff, but I never dug into trying to find out the answers to stuff like that. Um, yeah. even if I have a question 
about my own abilities. I'll go to somebody who knows myself better than I do biologically and 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 they can explain, you know, how I'm able to do the things that I do with my voice much better than I could. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so the next question that we have is when you're singing, um, what got you into optimism? How did you discover it in the first place? <laughs> Good question. Um, I am 54 years old. Um, I was born on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. And I didn't even know what the word octavist was. I never heard of it until about maybe 10 years ago. It was on a comment on one of my YouTube videos that someone called me an octavist. And so me, the way I am, I'm a researcher. So I didn't know if they were calling me a name or what. So I started <laughs> what an octavist was. You know, I didn't think it was anything bad, but still, I wanted to know what that was. You know, you're calling me an octavist. What is an octavist? So I started researching. And even then, there wasn't a whole lot found on the Internet with my research skills about what an octavist was. So that kind of baffled me. But within those years, I've noticed that it's a lot more common now. A lot more people know what an octavist is now. And a lot more people in the music world that didn't even know what it was 10 years ago uh, or five years ago. A lot of them are now understanding what an octavist is. And so, yeah, that's that's about when I first discovered that I was an octavist. Um, and there's a web a website, octavism.com, that you can go to, and it will help you understand a lot better than I could sit here and try to explain what an octavist is. And it also uh, presents to you different uh, short bios of living and, and past octavists in the music world. So uh, I would suggest, yeah, you check that out, octavism.com. You heard it from here first, folks. Check out Octavism.com. <laughs> By and the I way, Mr. Had... Mr. Holloway is on the list. <laughs> and I actually had the pleasure of being asked to do the trailer for the website. So that voice you hear speaking is me on their, on their website trailer. Awesome. So, Mr. Holloway, the next question that we have is, when it comes to singing, a lot of people think in their heads, okay, so when I sing... I must be loud. I have to be heard. Um, when you sing, do you think about projection or do you think about the musicality of sides rather than how loud you are? When I sing, I think about finesse and nuance because just like anything, nobody wants to be yelled at all the time. Nobody yes. wants to be yelled at two minutes and it's a song, you know? Nobody wants to be screamed at and it's a performance. Um, I can project my voice probably like the best of them, but the song is written and it'll call for crescendo or fortissimo and, and all those other terms where mm -hmm. it gives the song color and mood and nuance. And so those are some of the things that you learn like in music theory. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, and it takes, a, and, and to do those things, it takes breath control. It takes uh, proper breath control. So, so knowing how to expand your diaphragm, doing, doing different things uh, to expand your diaphragm or your rib cage, even uh, mm -hmm. for guys who work out, you know, if you have a broader rib cage to where your lungs have more room to expand, that's going to help you when you sing. And a lot of people don't think about stuff like that. Yeah, nice. Thanks for uh, thanks for that answer. Uh, I always wanted that myself, actually. <laughs> so so it's basic, it's basic techniques, breathing, you know, mm -hmm. posture, um, uh, uh, the way you stand, how far your feet are apart, how you hold your head, relaxed shoulders, you know, all those things have to do with how you project your voice and. And they're, they're, like I said, within a song, it calls for those things at certain moments, you know, to give dynamics to the song, to give drama to the song, you know, to, to exude a certain emotion uh, through the song. 
So, so those are the things that you learn and pick up on. But just somebody projecting in your face for two minutes or three minutes or five minutes, that's not pleasant to anybody. And it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not even pleasant for the voice that's doing it, mm. you know? So, uh, yeah. Uh, I learned a long time ago, just because you can do something doesn't mean you have to. Mm. Interesting. Because I know a lot of young bassists, they're all about, I have to be loud, I have to be heard. I must be yeah. the loudest. And for me, I struggle that with that as well because when I'm in choir, and well, the thing is for me, I am the only bass two in my choir at the moment. So I really have to do my job right. So I do have to project by myself. But when you're with other people, it can get kind of competitive when you're with under the bass and you're sitting there and you're like, well, that's, oh. that's why you have a conductor up front. <laughs> Because, because they hear the complete sound from yes. left to right, from top to bottom. So what we hear is the sound that's within our own proximity, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that starts with us. We're going to hear ourselves louder than anybody else right off the yeah. bat. And, and so that's why you just rely on the, the, the professionalism and the knowledge and the wisdom of the conductor or the yes. choir, director, you know, because they hear the sound from left to right, top to bottom. And so it's not about how we hear ourselves in the crowd. It's about whether that conductor know, lets you know that you're either blending or you're too soft or you're too loud. We can't really determine that for ourselves within a group of singers. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so what have you been up to during this quarantine? I know some of your fans are probably well aware, but I know some of them aren't. Well, uh, thanks for asking. We're fine and healthy and well here in Tampa Bay, Florida. But a lot of people aren't. A lot of people are hurting and a lot of people will be hurting for a long time. But um, for me and, and, and my family, my, my grown daughter and her three kids, my, uh, my three granddaughters, I call them affectionately the Pookies, if you follow me on social media anywhere. I always speak <laughs> about Pookies. Those are my three granddaughters. Um, they live with us. And so I've spent a lot of time just enjoying them. My wife had a chance to spend a lot of time home during that time, and, and it brought us closer together, even though we were already close. You know, you can always get closer. So um, it, it, it was a benefit to us in that way. For me, professionally, uh, where I thought I might take a dip in revenue because so many places were shut down. And if they're shut down, then I'm not promoting them or advertising for them. Um, and they don't have the budget for advertising because now that money needs to be funneled into more uh, important things to keep the lights on. And I understand that. So I was kind of embracing for that. But thankfully, um, to my surprise, it was the ap opposite. Um, I had more work in the past couple of months than I've had in a while um, on a regular basis. So that was that was great. So. Um, so, yeah, I just give credit to God for that and thank him for that and uh, just continue to uh, enjoy the blessings that he shows us. Amen. So for you, Mr. Holloway, when when people say that a singer a singer's timbre will will classify their category. So there are some people in the operatic world that will say it doesn't matter how low you can go, it's the type of sound that you have that affects what classification you have. So say I can say say it well technically um, say I was a baritone voice um, by operatic classification because of my timbre, but my range is Basso Profundo, I can sing all the way down to an A-flat one, but my mm -hmm. timbre isn't that of a Basso Profundo. Would you consider them a Basso Profundo or, or baritone? Well, my first question is, do they really care what I think? <laughs> <You> <laughs> um, but no, really, uh, I don't, stuff like that is, is like, you know, who's taller? And you're both pretty much the same height, you know? <laughs> Does it really matter? Uh, so uh, I take it back to what I said earlier. Does it sound good? Do you like the way it sounds? 
do other people like the way it sounds? Does it bring them warm, warmth and joy when they hear you? Um, are you exuding an emotion? Do they feel blessed by it? Um, do you do you have people walk away feeling like, wow, that was that was that was a well spent two minutes of my life listening to you, you know? Um, all that other stuff, you know, is wood, hay, and stubble, man. <laughs> I agree. I totally agree. And and so some... understand what that means. <laughs> oh man, it's good talking with you, Mr. Holloway. Uh, we're not yeah. finished quite yet. We've got uh, one more question before we end this interview. Yes. Um, and this question is: Is the tradition we have here at Talk Box with Octavist? And I'm pretty sure you know what I'm going to ask. What? Mr. Holloway, <laughs> what is your lowest note? <laughs> well, um, I think I've had it on several videos, if you follow me on YouTube or anywhere else, that um, I'm pretty comfortable down at an F1. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have been recorded down to a, a low E. Ooh, wow. Uh, where this, uh, on Octavism, Bastronomy, and Coral, they had a uh, scraping the battle challenge a few years ago. I think it was, <laughs> I think it was actually a spinoff of the Rock Modernoff challenge. Yes, I think it was. That uh, classic FM actually started, but um, but yeah, there were a few of us who took it a little further, and I threw my name in the hat, and uh, <laughs> and I sang down to I think it was an E, a low E. Mm. So that's that's my lowest recorded note. Nice. But, but you can hear me doing F's and G's and, you know, I can do those all day long. I'm being asked right now, can you do a low note for us right now? <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've just spent the last few minutes talking, so that does affect. But um, let me see. Uh, <clears throat> do you have a pitch pipe or a piano? I have an ukulele. <sighs> so this is C. C. This B. A. A. Oh my goodness. G. Can we go to an F? F. <laughs> F. Can we go to That's E? When you spend your time talking for a little while and then try to sing. Can we do E? Not, not, not right now. No. Not right now. That's the limit. F. Yeah, I, I say I'm. I'm I, with, F. with F. But that E, you know, that's 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 one of those uh, circus trick moments. <laughs> <laughs> that's All right, what I thank put you so. Video, you know? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Holloway, for this interview. I really appreciate taking your time talking with me about something that I love so much. Um, nope. And uh, guys, um, we don't know who's coming up next because there's a lot of people actually in line for the Octavism talk box. Um, but hopefully we get someone um, that you want to hear and want to see. Um, and uh, God bless and I hope you guys have a good day. All right. See you guys. All right. Take care, guys.